Leadership theory is nearly always presented in a way that infers that its attributes can be equally acquired by all. By accepting that diversity brings differing points of view, dependent upon the diverse characteristics of individuals, which are in turn developed by a diverse set of experiences, it makes little sense to assume that the pathways to leadership will be the same for everyone. If we look across the world, whether it be our largest corporations or our government leaders, it remains rare to see women leaders or those who are markedly different in other ways to the general population in those countries. Globally, for example, it is extremely exceptional to see those with physical disabilities or those with non-heterosexual orientations as our senior corporate or government leaders. Why is it then that there are so few leaders from diverse groups or backgrounds? Let's take a look at the lack of female CEOs of major corporations as an example. As we have seen throughout this course, Leadership is a developmental journey that is a lifelong process, and in this process childhood, adolescence and early work experiences cannot be overlooked as foundational times of critical learning. However, studies of the life trajectories of male and female CEOs and the developmental roots of leadership, as well as how CEOs come to acquire the skills necessary to fulfil the CEO role, have revealed privileged access to developmental experiences for men relative to women. Some events in childhood relate to the ability to take risks and to be successful, and these promote self-confidence in males around risk in later life. This occurs where the differential treatment of boys and girls in society regarding the ability to take risks in childhood play promotes less self-confidence and less self-esteem for women in work contexts. As a rule, boys are allowed to play rougher and are generally less well supervised in their adolescent years. Stereotypically, Males are expected to act agentically, with aggression and competitiveness, while females are expected to act communally with interpersonal sensitivity, and this is reinforced in childhood, usually by parents. For example, parents will more likely tell their daughters not to show off compared to their sons. Similarly, aggressive behaviour in boys is often labelled as assertive and rewarded, whereas the same behaviour in girls is considered bossy and is punished. This can have gendered effects, for example, on the ability to effectively self-promote and ask for pay rises or better assignments later in adulthood. Since most senior leaders are male, one persistent stereotype associates management with being male. To the extent that leadership connotes male, virtually all social interactions around leadership are influenced by gendered expectations around maleness. For example, effective leadership is often defined in terms of one's ability to influence a group of people towards a common goal. However, a double bind exists which severely limits women's abilities to engage in a full range of influencing behaviours. Since women are evaluated negatively if they are too feminine in their leadership style, as well as if they are too masculine. In adulthood, the inequitable division of domestic labour between men and women has consequences for the acquisition of social capital at work, such as being able to attend networking functions. Given that task completion must take priority over socialising, Eagley and Carly observe that those who cannot put in extra hours have far fewer opportunities to build social capital. In line with this is evidence that social capital is more essential to career advancement than skillful performance of traditional managerial tasks. This puts women, who have greater caring responsibilities for children, for example, at a significant disadvantage. Likewise, if male managers believe that there are stereotypical roles for men versus women, such as caring and supportive roles in organisations, then they are more likely to assign women to these support roles rather than field or operational roles. However, as reported by McCall, Lombardo and Morrison, access to and success in line role assignments are considered to be essential prerequisites to advancement to senior management positions. Effective leaders, especially those at the most senior level of corporations, such as CEOs, are expected to have demonstrated, usually through senior line roles within an industry, exceptional ability as leaders, strategists and business stewards, as well as possessing high degrees of intelligence, integrity and self-confidence. Further, they are expected to have a breadth of experience in one industry and a depth of experience demonstrated through continuous, uninterrupted employment. In a study of 60 CEOs matched by gender, differing pathways to leadership were explained with reference to leadership development across their lifetime. One of the biggest differences discovered in this study was the development of self-efficacy in childhood. 
The male CEOs all had adolescent leadership roles as captains in team contact sports, as well as a large degree of unsupervised freedom to explore and take risks. Characteristics associated with the development of leadership capital, such as self-efficacy and moral courage. The female respondents reported fewer practical leadership experiences in childhood and highly structured and supervised activities. However, in adulthood, it was found that mentors and sponsors played a pivotal role in building self-efficacy through providing challenges and feeding back evidence that the female respondents had the ability to progress and acquire the remaining CEO capitals. Sponsors were also instrumental in appointing females to their first line role. In other words, mentors and sponsors were instrumental in facilitating the development of self-efficacy capital, which enabled the female CEOs to acquire other valuable capital that is generated and refined in line role experiences such as strategy, stewardship and organisational leadership later in their careers. In the same study, Fitzsimmons and his colleagues found that in spite of the key role played by mentors and sponsors early in their careers, female CEOs still experienced persistent stereotyping, systemic discrimination and bias, which meant that they had to move far more often than their male counterparts in order to obtain promotions and undertook riskier appointments in order to progress. Critically, these female CEOs were often required to move outside of their organisation or industry to obtain a promotion. This meant that they were not getting the depth of experience in a particular industry, however they were often getting expertise or experience in ways that men were not. For example, specialising in functions across industries such as raising capital, or mergers and acquisitions. This meant that the kinds of CEO roles that the female CEOs occupied differed from the male CEOs, insofar as the female CEOs were appointed to organisations who had specific need of these contextual skills whereas men were appointed because of the breadth and depth of their industry experience. Siebert and others argue that social capital can be more essential to career advancement than skillful performance of traditional managerial tasks. In addition, Goldman proposes that social skill is still required to make the most of networks. Hence, in the above study, success in early leadership roles in the careers of both male and female CEOs were used by both sexes to gain greater social capital from their networks, while mentors and sponsors nonetheless played a greater role in the careers of female CEOs by providing access to career-relevant experiences as well as providing access to networks where that experience could be displayed. Finally, as Crabb notes, the study revealed the critical role played by the spouses of the male and female CEOs by allowing more time for their husband or wife to attend social networks by taking on more of the domestic workload. That said, it was a feature of the study that every married male CEO had a stay-at-home wife who acted as the primary carer of children, whereas the female CEOs were all the primary carers of their children and had husbands who still worked. However, each of their husbands had flexibility over the time they worked and could provide critical support when most needed. What we can see here is the complex interplay of many of the elements we have discussed throughout the course, acting in ways that cause different people to follow different pathways into different types of leadership roles across a lifetime. Unfortunately, many of the issues discussed above acted in ways that meant that one group, women, were disadvantaged relative to the other group, men, in obtaining industry appointments. These same factors can be used to explore how it is that other minorities suffer a similar fate. We as leaders have a duty to ensure equitable access to transformational leadership experiences for our followers, regardless of their gender, race, religion, sexual orientation, size, age or disability.